On a late August morning, just north of Lake Huron in Canada, a miracle of nature is about to unfold. This tiny caterpillar is destined to become a monarch butterfly. In one of the most amazing transformations in the animal world, the caterpillar will outgrow and shed its skin four times. The fifth time, the caterpillar disappears. It's transformed into a chrysalis, a delicate case within which a completely new being takes form. After about 10 days in the chrysalis, the new creature is complete. All traces of the caterpillar are gone, and in its place is a butterfly with four delicate wings. But the newly developed monarch butterfly must wait a few hours for its wings to harden, and then finally it can fly. This particular generation of monarch butterflies is special. Every year, about a hundred million of them begin an astonishing migration. Coming from southern Canada and the northeastern United States, each butterfly, starting on its own, flies about 2,000 miles, arriving two months later in Mexico. Their trip is part of a carefully timed cycle that began three generations back, when a group of monarchs left Mexico at the end of the winter. They flew as far north as the Gulf states mated and died. The second generation flew to the northern United States. There, they too mated and died, living only about a month. Their offspring, the third generation, completed the last leg of the journey to Canada, also surviving only about a month. But the fourth generation will live almost nine months, and they'll fly all the way back to Mexico in one epic trip. It's an amazing natural cycle that so far eludes explanation. The mystery starts at the very beginning of the trip because no one knows exactly what triggers the exodus from Canada. Well, when the monarchs leave Canada, they have a 2,000 mile trek ahead of them, at least. They're freshly hatched butterflies. They've never taken a long flight in their lives and they're on the way to an area that they've never seen before. Somehow they're recognizing landmarks or following streams or following the sun or following something. We just don't know exactly how they do it. It's really an incredible journey. A monarch's wingspan is just under four inches, and they weigh less than one-fifth of an ounce. So how they survive their marathon migration is another mystery. They only fly when conditions are perfect. If it's too cold, they get sluggish and can't flap their wings. If it's too hot, they stop flying so they don't get overheated. They must also stop often for nectar and water, but every time they land, there can be enemies lurking. Bad weather is also the monarch's enemy. A rainstorm can be deadly. If it survives enemy attacks and bad weather, a monarch that started in Canada has to fly at least 50 miles a day to get to Mexico. The physical effort this requires is remarkable for a creature so small, with such fragile wings. Butterflies are the worst possible body form for trying to make a long distance migration. They're simply a bad design. Every time they flap their wings, they're using energy at least 20 times the rate than when they're not flapping it. So they're just burning their fuel up at a great rate, much like, say, a helicopter might. And so they have to compensate for their inadequacies by soaring. Soaring is gliding and rising air much like I'm doing right now. The sun heats the ground, the ground heats the air above it. As the air heats, it expands and becomes lighter and begins to rise. And pretty soon you have a column of rising air. That's the thermal. Under good conditions, you can maintain the altitude you're at or even gain altitude. A more helpful maneuver is to circle in it. You see hawks doing this and vultures doing this all the time. Circling in the thermal, staying within it. And this seems like a wonderful free ride, and it is. Soaring, the key them getting to Mexico. On the shores of the Great Lakes, just days into their journey, the monarchs face their first geographic hurdle, miles of open water and constantly shifting winds. As the monarchs are migrating out of Canada, they hit the Great Lakes, which are a barrier. They can't see across them. With no land in sight, monarchs use their finely tuned sense of the direction of the wind to carry them across the water. If wind from the south, a headwind, threatens to blow them off course, they stop and wait. When they sense that the wind has shifted in their favor, they fly on. The ultimate destination of their incredible journey is a tiny area about 60 square miles and 10,000 feet high in the mountains of Mexico. The local people, called the Mazahua, have lived here for hundreds of years. They believe monarchs represent the spirits of their ancestors, and the arrival of the butterflies each year begins a celebration 
called the Day of the Dead. It's a very beautiful time when the butterflies arrive. The butterflies would come down, surround us, coming down to give the final touch to the tradition of the Day of the Dead. For those who live here, it's our belief from when I was a child. We would say they were the souls of our departed loved ones. Every year I make an altar. We put these things here because when our ancestors were alive, this is what they liked. That's why one waits for their arrival, to give them this offering. The legends of the people that live near the ocean and the mountains are important to them. For us, there is a sense of space, the freedom to fly, to fly with the imagination, to fly just like a butterfly. Homero Arregis is one of Mexico's best-loved writers. He grew up in these hills and has fought to preserve them for monarchs. Every year, Lincoln Brower comes here to continue his study of the monarch migration. When you were a young boy, Homero, yes. you used to go up to see the butterflies? Yes, every year we came with the school children, and for us it was one of the most fantastic spectacles of the year to go to the plain of the mule to see the butterflies. But the butterflies also came to the to town. They were across the streets. They flew through the town. Exactly. They were looking for water. Sometimes they, there was in your house. But there were millions of butterflies. And for us, it was a spontaneous miracle to see butterflies here in, in the Cerro Altamirano. But we didn't know that they were coming from Canada, across the United States. And the Canadians and Americans didn't know that they, they were coming to these places. It was not until 1975 that scientists discovered the full extent of the North American migration, when butterflies that had been tagged in Canada were found spending the winter. These monarchs return each year to 12 12 specific sites in these mountains. This is their only destination in the world. It's a perfect environment for the butterflies because of the unique climate. We're talking constantly about this microclimatic envelope, about 3,100 meters, usually on southwest facing slopes. If you imagine the forest as a blanket that protects the butterflies by keeping the heat in, and also think of it as an umbrella that keeps the rain out, and the tree is like a hot water bottle. It's radiating heat out through the bodies of the butterflies. So when the temperature drops down really low, you'll see millions of monarchs just festooning these beautiful trunk clusters. If you think about it, the bigger the tree, the more heat it holds. So this is an argument for maintaining the forest in its native state to let the trees get as big as they can and the butterflies will be protected during those cold periods. Monarchs live in other parts of the world in warm climates, but only Canadian and North American monarchs migrate such an incredible distance to avoid the certain death of a cold winter. And exactly how they navigate from Canada to Mexico is another unsolved mystery. Scientists only have a few clues. One theory is that the butterflies navigate by following a specific angle of the sun in relation to the Earth. Another theory proposes that the Earth's magnetic field may provide a subtle orientation guide. And recently, biologists discovered specific cells in the butterfly's brain that regulate their internal clock and help keep them on course. In 1992, Taylor started a project called Monarch Watch. School children and teachers tag butterflies from all over the northeastern United States. The tags don't hurt the butterflies and don't affect their ability to fly. But when tagged butterflies are recovered at various stops along the way to Mexico, tracing back the information on the tags helps reveal their flight path and their traveling speed. And one of Taylor's tagging experiments had a surprising outcome. The butterflies who've been moved to Washington started out flying in the same direction they would have taken to Mexico from their original home in Kansas, almost directly south. But starting from Washington, that flight path would never get them to Mexico. Amazingly, after a few days, the displaced monarchs somehow reoriented themselves and changed course to a strong southwest heading. That meant that even starting from an unfamiliar location, they still ended up in the right place in Mexico. Now this is really exciting stuff because what this says is that somehow this butterfly is acquiring celestial information, perhaps magnetic information, and it's integrating those and remodeling the physiology of the system to have a different 
vector. They have a different direction from where it came from. Now that's pretty cool. By late September, about a month into the migration, the monarchs are gathering into huge flocks. By this time, they've traveled more than halfway across America, over the industrial belt, through small Midwestern towns, across the Great Plains, and finally approaching the Southwest. No one knows how many monarchs die along the way. But if they make it to Mexico, there's another threat. Their destination in the Mexican mountains, the forests that will keep them alive over the winter, is in danger. It's like, you see all these trees, Lincoln? Yeah. Before there were hundreds and thousands, and now you can count them. And then they're all you see very tall and very wide. In 1986, the Mexican government protected some sections of these mountains as official sanctuaries for the butterflies for the winter months. But that meant some parts of the forest local people had depended on for income through legal logging operations were suddenly off limits. The result was an unexpected new threat to the monarchs, illegal logging. We all have needs. But those that cannot meet their needs, they are the ones doing the clandestine logging. They come at two or three in the morning. They go down in the night to sell the wood. Mexican police patrol the forest but have not been able to stop illegal logging. The World Wildlife Fund pays villagers to try to stop the destruction but they are no match for the dangerous forces at work. La tala vista como el Logging is clandestine and involves dangerous people. Se refiere a gente peligrosa. No se puede andar. So you cannot go around telling the world about it. Entonces de repente te ves solo, ¿no? Te das cuenta que vino su papá con un contingente completo y todo que como fue. Incluso con la policía. Sometimes you find yourself alone. Se queda la gente sola, ¿eh? And even with the police, you can be left alone. La, la gente la persigue. They will follow you to kill you. Entonces, no es tan It's sencillo. not that easy. Hay, hay que hacer su trabajo bien. ¿Quién va a dejar morir a sus, a sus hijos de hambre? Who would allow their children to die of hunger? No nos interesa para mí. We know that it's important to preserve the forest for the butterflies. But because of our need, we've not been able to do it. No, no se ha podido hacer.